Okay. Hi, everyone. Let's do this. <laughs> it's so good to see everyone here. Welcome to Women in Tech July session. My name is Sarpil Bayraktar, and I'm the program lead for WIT. I'm also a principal engineer in Chief Technology and Architecture Office here at Cisco. Um, I'm really delighted to have a special guest speaker today, Chuck Robbins. When I sent out the uh, uh, email about him, I got a lot of responses saying, hey, how did you manage to get on his uh, calendar? So I thought I'd tell the story quickly. Um, I've been running a technical project for the last two years, which is funded by Cisco's Tech Fund program. And I had the privilege to do a readout to Chuck uh, in April. And I can imagine I was very nervous. It's not something I do all the time, but it went really well. I was delighted to see the engagements and the questions coming from him. He even offered to be our product manager, which I might take you up on that. <laughs> so afterwards, I ran downstairs and I saw our uh, uh, lobby ambassador, Phyllis, and I said to Phyllis, I said, it went so well. I'm really glad I got to meet Chuck, and I wish that the rest of our community had that opportunity as well. And Phyllis said, why don't you send him an email and ask? You know, maybe he'll do it. So there we are. Without <laughs> further delay, I'd like, please help me welcoming Chuck to Women in Tech community. Thank you. Wow, thank you. How's everybody? Yeah? That's, uh, the moral of that story is, get to know Phyllis in the lobby. <laughs> Just a little bit about Phyllis so you know. She's been here almost 21 years in that lobby and has never taken a sick day. So there you go, next time she's here. Hi Phyllis, I bet you're watching. Anyway, this is, uh, this is a great opportunity for all of us. It's, uh, it's really great for me to be here. Uh, for those of you who are in the sales organization, I did want to just remind you that it, we are closing a quarter this week, in case you forgot. Um, some of you have been in other sessions I've talked about this week, so that joke is about the fourth time I've used it in groups, so I'm glad you still laugh. Uh, but this is, uh, this is an incredible opportunity for all of us. It's an incredible opportunity for... Uh, not only Cisco, but also just the industry. And frankly, this is an incredibly important issue for the world. And I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, we, we all recognize that every job in the future is going to have some element of technology content associated with it. Every company, every city, every country is looking at how technology fundamentally redefines their strategy as to how they achieve what they're trying to achieve. Historically, we've, we've looked at how technology enables strategy. Now every entity in the world is looking at how technology fundamentally defines or redefines their strategy. And so technology is going to permeate everything. So first of all, we can start with the premise that technology matters on a global basis, and it's gonna matter even more in the future than it does today. Then the, the element of diversity, and in particular women in tech, uh, this is a critically important issue again for both, for, for Cisco, for the industry, and for the world. For the world because of what I just described. For all of us because A, we need to just continue to further uh, inclusion diversity initiatives around the world. And I can tell you some stories about uh, how I uh, first became very passionate about this. Uh, and uh, I will tell you that I didn't even know why it was so important at the time other than it just felt like the right thing to do. And I'll tell you a quick story. This is about 15 years ago. And I was planning a meeting with all the managers who worked in my organization. And we wanted to do, the, we were looking at the agenda, and some of you may have heard me tell the story, but the agenda was Tuesday meetings, Wednesday morning meetings, Wednesday afternoon, team building, Thursday morning meetings, depart. I said, well, okay, that's great. So we've got to get to meetings, meetings, and then uh, team building. So where are we playing golf? Right? How many uh, women in the room would have defaulted to team building equating to playing golf? Right? 
And so I had some women on my team who actually were helping define it. And they said, no, why don't you let us come back with some recommendations on what the team building session might be? And their perspective brought us back to where we took 160 people and we actually went and did philanthropic work that afternoon in lieu of playing golf. And the people told me it was one of the most compelling and inspiring like team building sessions they'd ever participated in. And I tell you that because the value, that's what led me to say, wait a minute, there is incredible value in having people who have different perspectives helping think about how we do things differently going forward. And so from then, I have just been incredibly focused on this. If you look at my leadership team, you see a high concentration of women uh, and diversity in general. If you look at our board, 40% uh, of our independent directors are females. For those of you who I'm sure pay attention to our board on a very regular basis. Uh, and then further, the percentage of college graduates that are represented by women is increasing and the percentage of women who are choosing tech careers is decreasing so that's creating a net problem right so those are all the logical reasons why this makes sense <laughs> and then you can get back to the original issue is that it's just the right thing to do and so whether we're thinking about the efforts that we have here or whether it's the Grace Hopper event that many of you may have participated in over the years or anything else, whether it's some of our uh, networks that we have around the company where people can plug in and actually experience you know, uh, camaraderie with other people that have similar interests or similar problems or similar challenges. All of these things are critically important to our culture, the culture of the industry, and frankly, how we need to operate on a global basis going forward. So uh, I, uh, most of you probably know I started my career uh, writing code, and so I love to see all the youth in this room, and I'm sure they're everywhere out there. And I think we are at an inflection point where people are beginning to realize that technology is going to be at the heart of everything we do in the future, and so it's critically important for all of us going forward. So uh, I will uh, leave you with just a couple of final comments. Uh, know one thing. You have my support 150% for what you're doing. Uh, we appreciate your commitment. We appreciate all that you do for us every day. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity that we have in the future together. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your session and thanks for spending time with us. See you later. All right, great. Okay, so moving on with our session, um, I'd like to invite our guest speaker, Judy Priest, to hear. Um, Judy is one of the handful distinguished engineers at Cisco, probably in the industry. She has 30 years of experience in data center designs and silicon hardware. And uh, she's also been helping uh, women with their careers through several engagements. She's the technical advisor to women in science and engineering uh, employee resource organization at Cisco. Uh, she's the former executive sponsor of uh, Early Career Network. Uh, she's been chairing some forums and tracks at Grace Hopper. And I also had the privilege of having her as my mentor for the past two years. And she's one tough mentor. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what she's learned in blockchain, which is a new area for Cisco and uh, really uh, uh, Judy is uh, our technical lead in that, and I'd like to welcome Judy to Women in Tech. Thank you. Thank you, Serpil, and thanks for everyone for coming. Um, if the microphone sounds scratchy, it's because my hair goes in it, so just tell me to do the hair flip. Um, and I really am grateful that Chuck was here, too, because this is such an awesome community that we have at Cisco. 
I do talk to different groups around other companies, and I just think the Cisco groups are fantastic. So thank you for spending the time here today. And um, let's get into blockchain. So, oh, first a little bit more about me. Uh, I've been at Cisco now for 14 years, and I work in CTAO. And prior to that, I've worked in um, the data center office, uh, CTO office and um, UCS, a couple of um, platform technologies like silicon photonics and memory architectures, massively scalable data center, and our catalyst 4K and 6K. So a lot of data center centric things. Um, prior to that, um, the other companies I worked with, it's, it's a similar story. I, you, I went to school for applied electromagnetics. I came and applied it to my job and went everything from the deep submicron level down up to um, very large architecture scale. And then I joined CTAO, and those of you who know Dave Ward or maybe attended his talk here, he likes to take things and turn them upside down on their heads. And I mean that very respectfully and affectionately. Love the guy, we've been friends for over a decade. And um, when I came to CTAO two years ago, he said, you know, you feel like, like you're kind of hitting your stride in this data center stuff, so let's do something else. What about blockchain? And I said, um, I don't know. I don't really own Bitcoin. I can't really balance my own checkbook. So I, I don't really, I'm not that interested. He goes, okay, go away, go learn about it, and then come back and say something intelligent to me rather than what you just said. Um, so so this, is, this is what I learned, and I want to talk about the intro. I want to talk about all the stuff we're going to do with it. And, but first, let's start from the beginning, because blockchain is a technology that really isn't that old. So I want to kind of take you through the story of how it developed, why it's here, why are we talking about it, and where is it going? So first, what is blockchain? How does it work, right? It seems very fundamental, and it is. It's not that complicated. What's it used for? The use cases to me are the most important and interesting things and areas where we can see the most um, dynamic shifts in the industry. And what's the state of the industry? And more importantly, what is Cisco doing with it? So let's take a look at the Gardner hype cycle. And this was just the one that was published last year. Um, I hope the guys on the side can see. If not, feel free to open up your laptops and join WebEx. Um, so blockchain is near the top here, near the peak. And it's at the what they call the peak of inflated expectations, which means that the, what comes next is it starts to fall in this, along this curve. So right now, there's a lot of media hype, basically. And if you look at the color coding here, the blue dot is still looking at five to 10 years out for mainstream adoption. And that, that could still be accurate this year. And Gardner also said by the year 2030, the business value added by blockchain and its impact could grow to exceed $3 trillion. That's why the media hype. There's a lot of money involved here. So let's go back in history a little bit. And where did all this start? Usually, any big, any big um, solution starts with a big problem. And the big problem at the time was this financial crash in 2008. And it was said to be the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. And at that time, there was a lot of subprime lending in the US, oversold mortgages. There were countries like Iceland and Greece that were going bankrupt. There was, um, if you look at the lines here in Cyprus, people going to the bank to get out their money, and there was no money. There was nothing there. And people started to really wonder about central authorities. I trusted this bank with my money. I trusted this bank with my house, my mortgage, and now there's nothing. US families lost. $11 trillion in combined wealth. It was huge. So by 2009, the following year, this was what happened. And here you see a little constellation of um, financial services and Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin was this digital cryptocurrency that started. It had no value. It was just kind of like, here, here's a Judy coin, right? I mean, it was totally made up. But if you see, it was starting to catch a lot of the financial guys' eyes because of this financial crisis that started it. And as I go through the talk, I'm going to separate Bitcoin and blockchain, but today we're going to talk about it you know, early on in, in the same way because it is still intertwined. Now, if you notice, Cisco is actually in this cluster. And what Cisco did 
was invest in a company called 21 Company. And they were doing Bitcoin mining. And I'll talk about mining a little bit later, but it's basically they were building silicon chips to just go and mine Bitcoins. And then if you look at the landscape in 2016, just another seven years later, the, the constellations have grown up and uh, become much bigger. And that little pattern there on the right-hand side is a group of 80 banks that got together and made a, a, a consortium called R3. And they're still around today, and they're looking at financial applications for blockchain. So what is a blockchain? Very simply, it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. It is secure by cryptography, and it's a shared transaction basis, bit database that just has all these different transactions, and we'll talk later about what a transaction is, but it's all is a distributed ledger of all that data and everyone has a copy no one owns it but yet people can write to it once the data is valid now it's also called dlt you'll hear that a lot and it's that's distributed ledger technology which is again separates it from bitcoin a little bit and that's what kind of the cool kids are calling it now but if you read about it in the world economic forum you'll hear dlt that terminology quite a bit so let's look at the first like you know Question then, how is blockchain different than Bitcoin? Well, blockchain is the underlying technology for, Bit for Bitcoin and Bitcoin is just the application. So, but there are multiple um, cryptocurrencies. In fact, there's over 8,000 cryptocurrencies right now. And as a total market cap, it's exceeded $100 billion. So again, reason for the hype. Um, Ethereum is another one you'll hear a lot about. That also has its own cryptocurrency called Ether. And like I said, there's, there's so many more. So here's a little fun fact. Um, I make my kids kind of be captive audience sometimes for my slides. And they said, okay, you need to throw a fun fact in here, here and there. So the first purchase with Bitcoin happened in 2010 on May 22nd when Laszlo Hynek actually went, he went on this Bitcoin forum and said, I got pizza for Bitcoin. And it was awesome because it was worthless. It was like saying, you know, here, you like go have lunch or something. And, you know, and here's a coupon that I just wrote all by myself for you. It was worth nothing. And at, but at, if you look at that amount today in this cryptocurrency market, that 10,000 Bitcoin is worth more than $10 million. So anybody here own Bitcoin? I'm just curious. All right. My new best friends. <laughs> awesome. Oh, and by the way, May 22nd is Bitcoin Pizza Day, another little bit of useless trivia for you. So, um, so if you look at this picture, and remember that it, blockchain is just a decentralized ledger, right? In the first part, you have something that is centrally maintained. This is what we deal with all the time, like a Google Docs, right? Google keeps the document, we all have access to it. If you look at um, your bank, right? You might think, but yeah, but I have my own account. Yeah, but you're accessing their database to get the information on your account. And if you think of this as an intermediary, there would be like there's vendors, there's customers, and there's Visa or PayPal or something else in, in the middle that's brokering all of these transactions, right? And if you look at the decentralized model underneath, while the architecture looks completely different, functionality is identical. You can still have a registry. You can still have account balances. You can still run all your transactions, but now everybody has a copy of it and only the people who have access will be able to see it. Otherwise, it's cryptographically kept from them. So that brings me to the next question then. So then how is blockchain different than a distributed database? Because that's a lot what looks like what the other thing was. Well, there's two main things that separate a blockchain from a distributed database. One is a consensus algorithm and the consensus is something that every peer or node in the network has agreed this is how we're going to define a consensus it could be proof of work that which which is what bitcoin uses it could be pbft which is practically practical byzantine fault tolerance it could be anything there's multiple ones but everyone in the network has agreed this is how we're going to drive consensus and then there's a validation scheme so how do we, now that we know that's how we drive consensus, how do we know the data is valid? Maybe we need 75% of the people to say, yes, that's, that's 
valid, then okay, maybe it's two thirds, maybe it's 51%. Maybe we just have three people in three locations, Australia, London, and Japan say, okay, it's good. Whatever it, that validation scheme, it's been decided ahead of time, it's agreed upon by the network, and that is different from a distributed database where everyone can have various copies. It's not necessarily updated at the same time and there's still discrepancy in the data. So how does it work? This is the fun part. So there's basically three components to blockchain. One is the ledger itself. The ledger is the who and the what, right? It's all the data, it's who's transacting, what's the, what are the transactions, what's the date, what's the timestamp, stuff like that. There's the how, that was a validation scheme I just talked about. How do you, um, who has the authority to do what? And how do disputes get handled? How does the cryptography work? And then there's the messaging. Once the data is valid, everybody gets a copy of it and we cascade the messaging to everybody. Okay. So if I look into a block a little bit deeper, this looks a lot like a packet. And that's something we're very familiar with. So you've got this header and in the header has a couple of bits of information. And that's a timestamp, the version of the code that you used and a link to the previous block. And that's why you have a chain. And then there's the body, which is all the transactions lumped together. So what does a transaction look like? So let's take an example, right? Alice has some money and Bob has a, a car she would like to buy. So she puts a request in for, to Bob and that comes from her source address. And she signs it with her, with her key. And that key is like a digital signature. So we know, yes, that was actually Alice that transacted on this. And then Bob has a destination address and he has his key. And then when, they, when the assets are verified, right, the network knows what you have. And okay, yes, you have this cash. Yes, you have this car. It hasn't been bought or sold. You still own it. The assets are verified, they're transferred, is validated, and it's written to a blockchain with the public key that lets people know this transaction occurred. That's why if I'm now um, Judy and I want to buy Bob's car, it's already gone and it prevents a double spend. So let's look at another case of a transaction. Let's say there are two private keys that are required for this transaction and I don't really and Alice here wants to transact with Bob, but she's not really sure. So she wants to buy a laptop from Bob this time. And she says, you know, let's have a mediator come and watch this. So Carla is a third party that is uninterested in the outcome of this transaction. And so they verify their assets, the exchange, and Alice gets it and says, wait a minute, I'm not really happy with this laptop because for $2,000, I was ex expecting the latest Intel processor on here and I don't know what this is. So she goes and says, I'm not gonna give a key to, to this transaction. So case one, they go to Carla and Carla says, let's see, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. For $2,000, you should have the best processor and I don't think this is valid either. I think you got ripped off. So she doesn't give her key for this transaction. So the, it's not a valid transaction because it needed two. We only got one and that was Bob's. So second case, Carla comes in and says, well, it looks like there was nothing in this agreement prior that said anything about a processor. So I think it's a valid transaction. So Bob gives his key, Carla gives his key and the transaction is considered valid. This is another validation scheme, right? Um, so what's to prevent Carla from being paid off. I mean, what, maybe, you know, she's Bob's cousin or something. Um, you never know. <laughs> These are <laughs> anonymous people there. You don't know what they're doing. But so there could be a, um, uh, you know, like a reputation, online reputation for mediators, right? And if they, if they look like they're being paid off, you could, they could become not useful in this um, scheme pretty quick. So again, just public knowledge goes far. Third example is a smart contract. Now we, you know, let's look at buying a house. The buyer has a bunch of stuff they have to do. The seller has a bunch of stuff they have to do. And there's a whole bunch of other things, the CCNRs, title search and all of that. But as you know, if you've ever gone through this process or, you know, watched a loved one or parents go through it, there's a lot of paperwork. 
and there's a lot of emails and phone calls and scheduling this and could you come here and do this and what do you mean I have to pay for yet another inspection, right? So if all of this was documented on a smart contract and everyone had their key and everyone could be verified as identity as having a valid license, they could come in and by the time all this stuff was executed, we just go and transfer the funds and transfer the cars, here's your key, welcome to your new house. So what this does is it, it allows many things to work in parallel, takes out a lot of the intermediaries, and it brings um, speed to the entire transaction. So let's look at um, a little bit more of the basics of what the cryptography looks like. So this is a hash tree. And on the bottom, you have a bunch of leaves or, or input data, right? Those get concatenated at every level up to the final thing where it all comes up to X root. And the whole idea here is just that this hash function cannot be changed unless you change some of the inputs underneath. So that means that if, if I try to change X1 down here, it's going to completely give me a, a different X root. And what a hash function is, is something that takes a random amount of input and always gives a fixed output. Okay, so let's take this same tree and you can see right here, I have the same Merkle tree function here, except now I've put in transactions that go into hashes that go to this TX root. The other part of this block is, like I said, there's always a link to the previous um, block. So there, that's how I form my chain. There's a timestamp, so I know when this block closed. And there's this thing called a nonce. And think of the nonce as a, a password. It's like a way to decrypt TX root. So TX root is just a bunch of numbers and letters. They mean nothing until you have this nonce to go figure it out. And nonce is, is a, because it's a password, it's like a number used once, right? That's what nonce means. And once you put in your password, it's very easy to verify, right? You get through, you, when you log in, put your password, you're in. But it's very hard to guess. And that's why it's a good analogy. So here in the block validation, like I said, you have an input. And if you look very closely, the word over is spelled differently. And every time you put a different input or message, you're gonna get a different digest or output once you put it through the secure hash algorithm, which is just a cryptographic digest function. Now, so that thing what I mentioned about finding the nonce, this is what miners do in Bitcoin. They, all they wanna do is they go after and they, it's this very parallel algorithm and they just kind of keep guessing and guessing and guessing until they get it. And there is criteria on what is the correct answer. And when they get it, they use game theory to motivate these guys and they get a little part of a Bitcoin as a reward and they say, yay, I got it. Now, now mining, so that's why they call it mining. You're basically like digging for gold, but mining is a bad, bad thing. And why I said, this is why we start to um, separate from Bitcoin because it's a huge environmental impact. You can actually see where mining pools around the world, there's, there's holes in the atmosphere because of them. And they, here, um, I, there was a website that showed how much electricity was used due to mining and it's been taken down. So this is old data, so I put fact in parentheses, but um, it's really a fact. And um, so there, the Bitcoin, Proof of work uses 131 gigawatt hours of electricity every day. And if you look at um, per coin, that's three tons of carbon dioxide for co of cold fired energy, electricity. And by 2020, they say that Bitcoin could consume as much electricity as the entire country of Denmark. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to contribute to that. And there are better ways to, um, to get to the same goal. All right, so benefits, what, what, does, what can this do? Well, for one, it allows you to do transactions, but more importantly, it allows you to transact with people you don't necessarily know or trust. And it can speed things up by getting rid of intermediaries. And the data is there forever. 
is kept from the, from the Genesis block, from the very beginning, and you can audit any of this stuff. Like I said, easy to verify. So the data is there. And the holy grail here, why does everybody care about this? Is because we want you to be able to own your own personal information. And if you own it, then you can decide whether you want to monetize on it. And monetizing it right now, like who knew the data of where you were last night, where, you know, what, how many volumes of videos you watch, who knew that data was worthwhile? And people are using it and monetizing on it anyway, sometimes without your knowledge, but you could own that. And I'll go into some examples of, of how that works too. I think my finger isn't working here. Did I, okay. So, um, so if Bitcoin is, is so mature, why don't we just use it for enterprise? Is there something we can leverage? Well, maybe, but really this Bitcoin was designed for cryptocurrency and to get rid of the central authority. And really when we look across enterprise, there's so many um, better applications. For one, Bitcoin is public and we could use a private one, meaning that um, every enterprise knows their customers, they know their employees, they know their partners, and we could use that as an identity instead of you know, trying to go and, and create a new certificates of, depending on who you are. There's also permissions. Once we know who you are, we can assign permissions. And like I said, we're trying to get rid of that proof of work. And the bottom line is too, Bitcoin doesn't really scale to enterprise class. The latency and, and throughput isn't as where, where we need it for enterprise. So here's an interesting sales pitch. There's a guy um, who's the head of uh, business development at Bitfury, Mark Taverner, and his whole job is to sell blockchain. And he says he spends 80% of his time telling people blockchain isn't the answer. That's like a really honest salesman. <laughs> and um, so when the other 20%, when it is the right way to go, it's because you need a shared database. You have multiple people writing and you really don't have that much trust in what, what's happening, what's going on, and you need an immutable record. So if these criteria is not met, then don't use a blockchain. I hear all of these people with use cases and stuff, but a lot of times a distributed database will do. And don't use it if you don't need it. Okay, so what's it used for then? This is a ton of industries. It started out, like I said, in financial, but the reality is it, it, that is so heavily regulated, we're kind of going into other areas. And I think healthcare is a really big one. Um, IOT, supply chain, and I'm gonna talk about three in particular that I think are the most um, compelling. One is a supply chain use case, one is in electronic healthcare, and one is just in um, regular kind of identity and land titles. So if you just double click on just one of them of, um, of records, this is how many subcategories there are. So this is, I'm not gonna get into this, but I just want you guys to know that in every industry, there are so many specific use cases. And this is just for you to go, wow, that's a lot. Okay, so let's look at the supply chain transparency. And the first is the chain of custody. You've got your producers, which are the raw materials, right? The people who grow cotton for fabric. The manufacturers are the guys who make jeans into, from that fabric. The registrar and accreditation is something certified organic. Um, standards like fair trade. And you've got an auditor that comes in and says, was all of this done according to your claims? And you've got the consumer that it goes to. And here, if you look at, uh, on the bottom, the food safety example, same thing with fish, right? It, it's sustainably harvested. It goes through the trucks that's refrigerated. It, and you see everywhere it got to before it, it hits your table. And so this can be used for anti-counterfeit. If you can actually see the supply chain of where something came from, you can see everywhere along the way of the people that touched it and make sure that what you're buying is authentic. You can see also that, you know, the things were handled properly. So you might think, well, you know, all right, that's, that's okay, but I don't really care. I buy my Louis Vuitton bag from the company store in Santana Row. Um, 
I, I go to Whole Foods and get my organic broccoli. It tastes okay, maybe 10 cents more than Safeway, but I don't care. I, I like it. And that could be true. You, you may not care about this particular thing. But in 2008, there was also a case in China where infant milk was replaced with proteins and synthetic polymers. And um, there, it caused several deaths, but over 300,000 hospitalizations of infants. And to, to this day, they are still finding birth defects that came as, as a result of that. There's, there's brain tumors, there's kidney problems. And so if I were a mom living in that time where I had my first baby that was in, you know, impacted by this infant formula, I would want this capability for my second child that when I go to the store, I can take my phone, I can scan a QR code and it can show me everywhere that formula has been, including the raw materials. And if it came anywhere close to the city that had that problem, I wouldn't buy it. I would just go to another brand. So there are times I would say, you know, is your coffee 100% Colombian bean? You don't care, I don't care, you know, but there are areas where, it, where there's gaps in visibility for a supply chain. We don't know that there wasn't, um, you know, some, some problem, especially in raw materials. In the electronics industry, why does this impact us? electronics industry, almost every rare material came from somewhere in the Congo. And we want to make sure that it was mined ethically, not with slaves, not with children. Okay. Let's look at, this is not forwarding, a second example of electronic health records. So let's even look at the first two um, parts. You've got your patient, you've got your hospital and you've got your insurance, right? Just, just look at those three to start. So a patient goes into the hospital and then they get their bill. They're not going to pay anything until their insurance company pays, right? And then by the time the insurance company gets through their process, it's usually three to four months, goes back to the hospital to get payment. They hospital bills you again. It's another three to four months. It's probably about six to eight months before you get your final bill. At that point, you're getting it and you're looking at it and go, whoa, I don't even remember half this stuff. So you might go back on your phone and call your insurance company again and you know, get them to re-look re at this because surely you could pay more than this, right? So if you, now we're all like, you know, responsible Cisco employees, we all get this bill and even if we argue it, eventually we pay it. Just as a shout out, just shout some numbers at me. What percentage do you think People who get this final bill never pay it. 80%. What? 80. 80? Wow, very cynical person. <laughs> <laughs> Any other numbers? What, what do you guess? 15. 15, yeah. That's, I would have guessed it was probably around 15, 20. Well, the reality is it's around two-thirds of the people take the final bill, don't pay it. So now think about what your hospital is doing. They are acting like a bank because they render their services. They're not getting paid for six to eight months out, maybe never because their patient just chucked it, right? So they're acting like a bank and they're not set up to do this. So now they have to go get collections people, which costs them more money. How do they manage? They can't. So they keep rising healthcare costs, which is a huge problem. Now let's look at the, the last part of this, what about the pharmaceuticals, right? What's to prevent me from saying, hey, you know, um, I, I go to my first doctor and I say, hey, I have a, some back pains. Could you give me a, some Percocet for that? And I get a prescription. I go to my second doctor. I said, I have some back pains. Could I get some Percocet? And they give it to me. I go to the third doctor. Same thing happens. I take all of these drugs and I go and sell them on the street. Now, and I have an injury, so <laughs> this, I'm just talking hypothetically. I would never do that. <laughs> However, the, if you had all your data on a blockchain, so, that, so there's an estimate that you'll probably go and see at least 40 doctors in your lifetime. And each time you go to a new doctor, you have to go and fill out your, all your information and your family information, your family history. And after a while, you don't even remember what year your mom had some operation and stuff like that, right? So if this was all on a permanent record somewhere and you could just give your new physician key, an access code to get that,
then you don't have to worry about it. And in the case of you know, the double spend or the patient that goes and double dips in, in medication, they would say, oh, wait a minute, you, you might have even had a different name at that point, or you might have even had a different doctor or you were in a different location, but I see you've already been treated for this. So that's to prevent that. The other piece is if you link that supply chain piece to the pharma, you've got the counterfeit drugs, right? And it can also help reduce that. So what about counterfeit drugs? Let's play a game of name that drug. This accounts for 90% of the counterfeit drugs that were seized in 2015, and up to 77% bought online is fake. What do you think it is? What? Louder. Xanax. Xanax. Tylenol. Good guesses. Good guesses. I would have guessed some antidepressant myself, but <laughs> some happy pill, you know. Uh, it's actually Viagra. Yeah, there you go. Now all the guys are like, why am I here? I'm just the reporter. I did not make this up. Um, counterfeit Viagra is made of detergents, road paint, rat poison, floor wax, brick dust, drywall, talcum paint, ink, ink from ink cartridges, pesticides, because everyone knows it's blue. The people who bought it online sometimes have never seen real Viagra, so they don't know the real shade, they just know it's blue. So they make it blue with all that stuff, it's terrible. And the other... Um, other 25% is not Viagra for women, the pink pill. It is um, all these others the, for high blood pressure, antibiotics, arthritis. And the, but the real impact here is that fake drugs are up to 10% of the pharmaceutical market. That, that really surprised me. And it, the impact, again, monetary, is $75 billion in 2011. And if you think of healthcare as a whole, as a market, it's 17% of the US economy, a number that also surprised me. So this is a huge thing, and this is an area where blockchain can help. Okay, so third example, third use case, let's talk about um, land titles. There's a country in the Baltic called Estonia, a very small country, and because of its location, it's been pretty much conquered by everybody. Um, <laughs> All their neighbors, not so friendly. Um, Sweden, Denmark, Russia, Germany have all taken ownership of, of um, Estonia at one time. And in 1991, they finally became independent. They literally stood arm in arm across the bo uh, border and waited for um, Russians to leave. And luckily, this was at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think, you know, Gorbachev probably looked at them and said, you guys are too high maintenance, can't deal with you right now, I got bigger problems. And so they left. And so, and they even commemorate their oppression with that black stripe in their flag. But here's the thing, so it's, if I decide, okay, this is my family's land, right? And this is my farm for my grandfather and Russian soldiers are storming my land. What can blockchain do to help? Nothing. It's, it's a technology. It's not a magic unicorn, right? <laughs> but um, however, what oppressors do when they first come to take over your country is they storm the capital, they burn all the buildings, which means they burn all the records. So um, Estonia has gone digital, and everything is digital. The only two things you can't do online there is get married and get divorced. <laughs> and, and they have taken all their digital records, all their citizens' records, and spread it across five different allied countries um, outside of Estonia. And so now that they are independent, what happens when the soldiers leave? And they said, you know, okay, my, my brother Vladimir likes your land and three other farms here, and they've combined it all into one thing. Well, now these land titles that show the boundaries of your property are in permanent record. And when, they, and when the oppressors leave, you can actually get your land back that was rightfully yours. Okay. That's huge value. Okay, so what's the state of the industry? This is where um, blockchain startups, the landscape, and this is not all of them because all of them are over 1,200 around the world. But 
these are 130 that are major, and you can see they're in all of these different um, various markets and various industries. And as an investment, it's over $2 billion now around the world. And some of the blockchain players, some of the big ones, like I said, there's a lot of those startups that are niche that are looking at specific applications in specific markets. But um, there's also a, a lot of, um, there's two large players right now. One is IBM, um, who uses their open blockchain code, to, and they donated a bunch of it to open source, and Microsoft, which is Ethereum-based. And they are not looking at currency and cryptocurrencies either, right? Like, like us. We're not interested in this because there'll never be a Cisco coin. There's, um, we're looking at blockchain as a service. And that means that they want to manage your stack. But mostly, these two guys, what's, what's, what do they have in common? They have their own cloud strategies. And they want to sell more cloud capacity. So IBM wants to sell you Bluemix. Microsoft wants to sell you Azure. And they think that this storage of data that you need to have is where they're going to make some money. IBM is also doing consulting services. But again, that doesn't really scale. Unless you have a lot of customers, then the problems start to look a little bit similar. You can create templates, and you can start using, using common code. Um, there's a lot of consortia out there. R3, as I mentioned, the group of banks, primarily. Linux Foundation Hyperledger Project. Um, which Cisco is a member. If you can see the purple asterisk, the, these are areas that Cisco is a member. The um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Um, there's the Blockchain Consortium something. It's, a, it's primarily in Asia. Um, there's about 130 companies there. And the IoT Trusted Alliance, which we also are doing. And noticeably absent that I just, this is just a, hey, you know, a little head scratcher for me. I don't hear much from Amazon and Google and Apple on blockchain, which is very odd. They will, you, but by then you'll know more than them. So, okay, so what is Cisco doing with it? Like I said, one thing is the Hyperledger project. This is over 150 companies, and we just um, bumped our membership up to premier status. And um, what Hyperledger is looking at for is really the enterprise-grade solution that is uh, modular in architecture and that you can go off and customize the blockchain that you need. If you look at what I mentioned before, the, all those different use cases, if you look at this long enough, uh, you'll, uh, they'll all need different types of blockchain architectures. And they're very unique and customized. And you don't want to just use what someone else is doing for your, to solve your particular problem, right? Um, Ethereum, almost same size in terms of membership. And what they're looking at, instead of a modular, composable, configurable blockchain, is one that's programmable. So they, are, they leverage a lot of the smart contracts. And um, they're also, tr and they, there's the, Ethereum Classic, which didn't have the performance that they needed, so now they're going more enterprise grade. Okay, so Serpil asked me to have a slide in here. <laughs> what happens if you want to know more? And um, there's actually a lot of research, uh, resources out there. If you just Google Hyperledger, these, these are not complicated websites, right? Um, Hyperledger.org, <laughs> I think you can remember. And, and you'll find lots of it. If you just Google these names of Hyperledger, Ethereum, Trusted IoT Alliance, these will all come up. They all have code bases as well on GitHub. So um, if you need this, just um, send me an email. I'm happy to send you any, any pointers you want. So let's take a look for a minute at the network stack, right? So we have those applications that I mentioned um, where we are seeing a lot of the startups. We have this blockchain smart contract layer. And we have the infrastructure layer, and of course, security and analytics run throughout. So the application layer is, has historically not been something Cisco's been involved in because they're so siloed, right? Um, the blockchain and smart contract layer are all open source. So the infrastructure, security, and analytics piece are definitely areas where we can add some value and we can add, um, if we had infrastructure that was aware of blockchain, then that could be really useful. And we could consider yourselves as the arms dealer for blockchain. We could sell that for everybody to, to build platforms on. But we actually are doing activities in every layer of the stack. We, for the applications, like I mentioned already, we've, we are doing the um, IoT 
trusted alliance which where the things themselves are talking on that application layer they're not going down to the blockchain layer they're not going through infrastructure we want a, for example a car if you think about iot and stuff a car can recognize another car why can't they swap each other why can't they trade owners right the, the, we did a chill lab which is um, the cisco hyper innovation living lab we did a session on digitizing the supply chain um, if from making that more secure we have several proof of concepts going on internally on supply chain. Um, uh, in the blockchain smart contract layer, we're involved in the consortium, all open source. And um, I have a tech fund project that's looking at creating infrastructure hooks because all of this right now is infrastructure agnostic, but I really think we can add more value there. Okay, so in summary, there is a lot of media hype. The industry is still experimenting, and there are definitely early deployments. And it, because it's in so many industries, it's really not a question of when, um, or, or it's not a question of if, but really when. When will these adoptions become more prolific? And the thing is, you know, it's most useful because there's an ecosystem there. If it's not a matter of trust, if like Cisco having its own blockchain doesn't make sense because we get paid what Kelly Kramer says we get paid. Your job is what it is. You know, there's nobody to argue. We have this central authority. But as soon as we go out the walls of Cisco and we have to deal with other companies, partners that we trust, customers that we trust, or new ecosystems that we're getting into that we don't know that well, that's where it becomes useful. And right now, there is no standard for um, business to business communications. So the reality is this is not going to be a blockchain, but a network of blockchains. And blockchains need to be able to talk to each other. And that's another challenge right now. Um, there's, no, there's no standard, there's no protocols either that are widely accepted. And then we are heavily invested in open source and industry consortia because where there isn't these standards and protocols, the, it's the consortia that will drive a lot of the de facto operations and, and ways that people work. And like I said, we're actively pursuing blockchain proof of concepts and we're working with those subject matter experts in those application silos so that we can create, create a business model because we're still trying to figure out what can we do with this. Okay, a lot of stuff, all right? Take a deep breath. That was more for me than you. But um, let's, let's think about this for a minute because that was a lot of information. And a lot of times blockchain is being compared to the internet. So... Let's go back and think about where the internet was 40, 50 years ago. Well, at the time, they thought the most disruptive thing would be to mail, because now we can do electronic mail. And oh my gosh, what's gonna to happen to the whole mail system? No one could have foreseen gaming, social media, e-commerce, right? Do you buy anything in stores anymore? And so if you e-commerce turns into the effect on retail and how people are shopping differently. We're talking about IoT here all the time, right? So blockchain is really in chapter one of a very long novel. And we, can, we don't really know where it's going yet. And many experiments will fall short. We, we already know that and some have. Um, but there's a, anything that impacts that many markets in this many industries, it's going to be big. So just imagine what it could do in terms of local trade, personal finance, and the global economy. Wow. And, um, you know, I, so that's, that's all I have. I hope that you guys learned something or at least had some food for thought. I hope you know something more about blockchain now than you did an hour ago. And I hope this was useful for you. Thank you. That was awesome, thank, thank you. you. And we have about 10 minutes for questions, so, and uh, online questions as well. Thank you. Hello there, that, Hi. Was, that was fascinating. Is there thank any you. chance that Apple and Amazon and Google are investing in some Bitcoin um, via uh, companies that they own, like shell companies or something? Because it seems, seems odd that they would be absent. It is, isn't it? Um, it they, they're out of the media, I can tell you that. And they're also not in any of those consortiums. And so, like I said, the people in the consortiums, we consider the technology still to be a little bit pre-competitive. 
So you get a lot of industry people working together to create these ecosystems. And even though R3 created one specifically for banking, it really didn't work out that well. There's been a lot of um, debate about what, what they're doing. And some companies have already dropped out. So I, I have no idea. I think there could be some level of currency that they're going to be looking at. Um, but there's already 8,000 cryptocurrencies. Do we need an Apple one too? <laughs> and really, what would you do with it, right? That, that's the problem with any non-fiat currency. Uh, fiat meaning that it's backed by a government. And so, I don't know. Good question. Tell me if you hear anything. <laughs> Anyone, any questions online or? Hi, Judy. Um, there was a question regarding energy consumption. Let me get that. Uh, are there energy consumption statistics regarding the process of creating government currency today to compare with the three <laughs> megawatt required by Bitcoin? And what are the alternatives and are they tested to be just as secure? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, printing money, forging coin, that, that does cost something. Uh, for sure. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing the, the whole digitization going on everywhere. You know, as we transfer money anymore, I, I haven't actually seen money from Cisco go to my bank account, but I see the numbers on a ledger and I believe it's there, right? Um, so no, I don't, I don't know exactly what it takes, but, um, and it's still a, a problem right now, even with actual fiat money that we have to go and transfer it to another currency when we travel, right? Wouldn't it be great if all of this was just digital and we could just get rid of all of it? I mean, I, and you know, all the cryptocurrencies too, like Bitcoin actually had to, had to go make coins. They're worthless. They, they don't even represent any, an actual Bitcoin, but they have a little logo on it. And, you know, because people needed to touch and feel something. And so, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. Get rid of the paper money. Hey, um, do you have any uh, thoughts on ideas that uh, th there have been there have been a few ideas published on uh, re potential replacements for proof of work and to kind of lower the energy consumption associated with the c running a blockchain? Uh, are there any ideas that you feel are really have the potential to replace proof of work? Yeah, and actually, um, so even the ones that are using proof of work are often moving to proof of stake and others. Um, but the one that's very common is the PBFT that I mentioned. And that's a practical Byzantine fault tolerance because in, in a group of an untrusted network, you have to assume some people are going to be bad actors. And if you, it, it's kind of the classic Byzantine generals um, problem. You can look it up on Wikipedia if you want. But what happens if I've, I've already called off the war and one of my generals over there is still fighting, right? He's, he's, it, it, maybe he didn't get the message. Maybe I messaged it in broadcast and he didn't get it. Maybe he just wants to keep fighting because he's just, you know, still, holding a torch for something. Um, but I don't know, I can't, I can't know. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assume that some percentage, if the vast majority, if this half of the room agrees, then it's gonna be valid, right? And if this half of the room goes offline, then I'm gonna assign new people that will give me the percentage that I need that we all um, can agree. So yeah, it doesn't have to be proof of work. You don't need a NAS, it doesn't, it, um, I think some of them are even more secure the way the blockchain works right now, it takes, it's set up so that it takes about 10 minutes to create the nonce, to figure it out. And as it becomes more and more complicated, you're doing more and more transactions, they're still trying to keep that time to 10 minutes. And because the block is linked to the previous block, if you were actually to do a blockchain transaction now, somebody could potentially double spend on a side chain and you wouldn't know about it for an hour. So who can wait an hour to get that laptop back or something, you know? So um, a lot of these guys, when they're selling stuff, they don't care who to, they sell it to. They just want the price to be met and here's my, here's my merchandise. So um, I think that that latency and that performance is not acceptable. So as much power as they're burning, it's still not adequate. Hi, Judy, we have a question from the bridge. Any sure. thoughts how blockchain can help global warming climate change? <laughs> I don't know, it's not a magical unicorn. <laughs> um, I, think, I think in terms of, um, I mean, there are ways right now that they're monitoring energy, right? And, and er energy usage with these digital tokens and, and stuff like that, and blockchain can help that. 
Um, there's a, actually a really great research project at MIT where they're t having um, a little village it, a kind of doing their own energy, um, like maintaining it. They, they've got a bunch of solar panels that were um, given to them and the village is, is trying to fi figure out how to manage energy basically and have other people, if you have no skills, then maybe you can clean the panels. I mean, if you, if, or maybe you wanna trade sheep for some more energy and you know, so there, there's this little closed ecosystem that they're trying to develop. And I think that that's probably a little bit more um, energy friendly than trying to, you know, cable things over and, and stuff like that. But in terms of global warming, I mean, that that is a big problem to solve. I think it, maybe that's the future of blockchain. It would be great if it was. I'm not connecting the dots right now myself, but let's keep thinking about it. Hi, Judy. Thank you so much for the informative uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, and so you mentioned in your presentation that there's a lot of media hype surrounding Bitcoin and it's been compared to the tulip mania, right? And so there's a lot of divisiveness on, in the market about you know, the valuation of Bitcoin. So from an investment staying, uh, angle, how d is Cisco responding to the potential risk in the valuation and the fluctuation uh, in the price of Bitcoin? Um, Cisco is not involved in Bitcoin at all. Bitcoin is a completely separate, and, and any involvement that I said what Cisco's doing, there was no mention of currencies in there. That's not what we're, that's not the area we want to go into. We want to look at it from a technology perspective and how it can help our customers. And those customers are within those, those markets that I identified. So um, totally separate things. Okay, thank you. Hey Judy, thanks for kind of coming up here and uh, talking about such a, um, an underrated technology. <laughs> hey. um, so Cisco, along with IOTA, Consensus, and a couple other companies, um, recently entered the uh, Trusted IoT Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to know what kind of solid steps um, Cisco has made in the field, uh, because I know like J JP Morgan's Quorum exists, and of course IBM's Hyperledger, and Microsoft Azure. All these uh, enterprise-facing platforms are out there, but nobody seems to have made any solid steps in, in um, trying to establish dominance within the space or coming out with any uh, solid use cases. As you mentioned, there are a lot of uh, POCs. Um, but I was just curious, uh, on the internal side, what um, solid projects, if any, uh, Cisco has been working on? Yeah, um, we, we do. And um, because this is going external and there are many external people in the audience and it's being streamed on YouTube. I don't really want to talk about that right now, but um, I can tell you that the proof of concepts that we're doing are going to lead to minimal liable products. So they are going to MVPs and we are looking in supply chain space as well as IOT and, and healthcare and others. So. Hi Judy, we have a question from the bridge. Yes. Can you touch upon the challenges with regards to security for Bitcoins and what are the steps already in flight for thwarting them? The, say, could you repeat that? The security steps can, for Can Bitcoin. you touch upon the challenges with regards to security for Bitcoins and what are the steps already in flight for thwarting them? Um, so there's actually a couple of vulnerabilities in the code you might have read about um, and there was the big DAO one, which was several millions of, of Bitcoin that um, they could see there, but no one could touch it. <laughs> so, so blockchain gives you a lot of visibility, but you know you have to be able to access. A lot of people think that assets, the only thing about assets is, is what it is your ability to spend, right? You may have something, but if you're not gonna use it to buy anything, then who cares how much it's worth, right? It might have some emotional content to you, but your asset, if you think about assets as only your ability to spend and trade, then that becomes a whole different way of looking at everything you own. Um, so Bitcoin, there's, um, I don't own any Bitcoin, so I don't know, I'm not keeping up on the values daily. It's overinflated in my personal opinion right now. Um, and the security piece, there's, there's several things. There's uh, the latest thing was like a fork that had been created, and I think they're trying to fix that. I, I'm not a Bitcoin expert. Thank you, Judy. One more question from the bridge. 
Should we take a lead in digital identity management, which is very much a security play? MS and Accenture appear to be out front here, along with some interesting startups. Absolutely. The, the answer is an emphatic yes. I think um, the identity management piece, it's a very crowded space, to be honest. There's like uh, at least hundreds of, of these startups that are working in that. But that is a big piece because all of this goes back to your personal identity and what you use, what you do with that data. So I, I think, you know, being a security company that we are, we have a little bit of a um, advantage there and we should be using that for everything we can and applying that to all these Bitcoin applications and, and blockchain applications, I mean. So, yes. Okay, we're just gonna Thanks. take one last question. Hi, I'm Jose Silva, part of the Worldwide Sales Internship Program. And my question is, as of right now, with my perspective, it seems that these blockchain initiatives are directly competing with Cisco security initiatives. So my question goes, is blockchain as of now, being that it's secure, friend or foe for Cisco? So um, I don't see it as direct competition, actually. I see it as very complementary, and that there are areas that we could add into this. So like I said, blockchain right now is very agnostic to the infrastructure. It doesn't care what cloud you're using, what servers you're using, what switches and routers you're using. But if we could make our infrastructure and take advantage of our security portfolio that we already have, we could add in a lot more things and areas are in the robust identity, right? Uh, making sure that people are who they say they are, what, that they're accessing transactions that they are allowed to do. But um, also like next gen firewalls and stuff like that. There's a lot of things where you may want areas of your blockchain to have channels or lanes or something, however you want to call it. They're separate from other things. Competitors don't want to be on the same blockchain because while we kind of trust cryptocurrency and the cryptography, we're not really that convinced that we want our data and their data to be on the same blockchain. So I think we have a lot of opportunity here to use our security to help sell blockchain infrastructure and blockchain applications in a different way. Thanks. Okay, um, I'd like to thank Judy for this great presentation. Sorry, we're out of time for questions, uh, but you can email her or uh, let us know. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And in closing, I want to thank you all for coming today, especially the people on the in the overflow rooms. Um, I'm going to send out a survey to everyone registered, whether you're here or not, because I can't tell the difference. Um, if you can, please take a few minutes to let me know what we can do better or what you like. That would be great. And then in August, we're going to have two sessions. Uh, in about two weeks, Liz Santoni is going to talk about the data center strategy. Thank you very much.